All right. Hi, everybody. Um, like Tiffany said, my name is Maya Hazlett, and um, uh, my title uh, for my job is Crop Science uh, Education Specialist. And so I work for Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, and I, uh, I actually work for both uh, Ag and Natural Resources at Iowa State, and I work for uh, Iowa 4-H as well. Um, and so I get to sort of work in both um, the uh, youth programs um, side of things and also in the more agricultural science. Um, and so it's, uh, it's interesting for me and fun for me to get to, do, get to do both of those things. What my job is, I do a few different things um, for my job, but probably the, uh, my favorite thing that I get to do is to actually go out around the state and do programs with youth and actually teach youth about different um, topics related to uh, crop production and crop science. So in these photos, these are all some examples. Uh, in this photo here on the, on the left, I'm doing some soil science experiments. Uh, in this center photo here, we're identifying some insects and some plant diseases. And then in the right photo here, we are looking at some um, live monarch butterfly caterpillars. So these are just some examples of the fun things that I get to do. Um, in addition to that, I also help uh, plan uh, educational experiences. So I, I plan lessons and um, activities and um, things like that and share them with uh, educators in the state so that other people can um, provide that education. So I wanted to share a little bit about my journey, which I'm guessing you've heard now from um, different people that the journey is sometimes crooked and um, go a few different directions um, on your way. And so the, uh, the first part of my journey is uh, I got a biology degree from Iowa State University. Uh, and I really enjoyed that. I took a lot of great, fun, interesting um, classes. And I decided that after that, I was gonna study plant pathology. And so, uh, I'm wondering if in the chat, uh, anybody can guess what plant pathology is. And the photo on the screen there is kind of like a hint as to what plant pathology is. Does anybody want to take a guess in the chat what plant pathology means? It's an ology, so it's the study of something. Or feel free to unmute. You can do that too. Yep, that's fine too. Plant study, yes. So it is studying plants, but it's something more specific related to plants. Yes. All right, Mary Sue, it does look like a sick onion. It is a sick onion. So plant pathology is the study of plant diseases. And so I started out um, with uh, in graduate school um, studying how plants get sick. If you didn't already know, um, plants get sick too. Um, they get viral diseases and bacterial diseases, um, just like people do. And so um, I started out doing research. And um, the research that I did was on oak wilt. So this picture up here in the top that uh, you can see that this tree here does not look very good. It looks all brown. The other trees are all green and happy and this one's brown. And that's because it's an oak tree that's dying because of oak wilt. And oak wilt is caused by a fungus 
You can see here, there's some fungus and that's growing under the bark of the tree. And so it's infecting the tree. And so for my research, I actually studied how these little beetles, they're called sap beetles, how these, they're little teeny, tiny little beetles and how they spread um, the disease. This is actually a really important um, disease of oak trees in a lot of places, but in Iowa um, as well. So I started out in research. Um, it was fun. I really enjoy um, collecting and analyzing data. But then when I graduated, my next opportunity uh, was in teaching, was in teaching plant pathology. And so I uh, moved to uh, Wisconsin and um, did uh, teaching plant pathology, but also uh, general biology. And so I uh, was able to, um, that was also fun. It was different. Um, I hadn't had a lot of experience at the time when I started. So I really had to learn a lot um, about how to teach because um, teaching and research are different. So I learned a lot um, about teaching and that enabled me to um, get this job that I have now because I have that background in the science and um, things related to, to crops like diseases and insects. Uh, and so that allowed me to get this job. And in this job, I get to teach about a lot of different things. So I put up pictures here um, for all the different things that I get to teach about. Um, so here's some, this is diseased wheat. Um, I get to teach about um, production and using pesticides. I get to teach about soils, about bacteria, uh, insects, weeds, um, pest, uh, pest insects, as well as beneficial insects like bees and butterflies that are pollinators. And so I get to teach about a wide variety uh, of different topics, which is fun. Um, so uh, the, the thing that I sort of discovered through my, my path, um, you know, I started out in biology and I really like all the creepy, crawly, slimy, fuzzy things. So all of the, um, all those parts of biology. So if you're interested in things like bugs or um, plants or mushrooms, um, I just put up some of the different um, fields um, that you can study uh, related to these different areas. Um, so entomology is the study of insects. Horticulture is um, study of growing plants. It's usually related to sort of smaller, uh, smaller crop production or um, gardening, greenhouses, things like that. Uh, agronomy is the um, study of crop production. Plant pathology, where I talked about. Microbiology is those bacteria and fungi. Um, genetics and molecular biology, if you're interested in learning more about how living things really work and function. Um, and then ecology, if you're interested in things like pollinators and the environment and conservation. Um, so my journey is a little bit different. I uh, have a job similar to Maya. I, the only difference is that I work with animals and not plants, but our titles and our um, structure of our positions are very similar. Uh, so my story starts out with a little lamb. Instead of Mary having a little lamb, Amy has a little lamb. And I showed that lamb all through 4-H and continued to be very active in the sheep industry. And that is sort of what drove me to my position uh, that I'm in now. And when I started out, uh, I have two older brothers and uh, my, my dad was very involved in the sheep industry. He was also very involved in 4-H. He was an extension agent and then became the director of 4-H in Tennessee. And uh, so I naturally became involved in 4-H and was a state leadership winner. I was state 4-H council president, uh, showed a lot of sheep. Not the best uh, look for me there, but um, then I attended the University of Tennessee where I received my Bachelor of Science in Animal Science. 
And one thing I would encourage you to do as, um, as a young person is to be as involved as you can, both in high school, middle school, and even in college. And so I was uh, a member of the meat judging team, uh, the academic quadrathlon team, which is kind of like if you've ever done skillathon or quiz bowl, it's kind of like that for animal science. And then I received my master's degree in ag and extension education because I wanted to combine my love of animals with my love of people and the ability to teach and share that knowledge with others. While I was in college, I did a lot of internships. I uh, did data analysis at the Ag Policy Analysis Center. I was an intern at the American Hampshire Sheep Association where I was responsible for the All-American Junior Show. Then I sort of dabbled into extension when I was a junior in college and was a program assistant and did an after school science program called the Wacky World of Science at four after school sites. And then my senior year, I interned at the National 4-H Center with the Citizenship Washington Focus Program. So all of those experiences together kind of guided me towards my first career in extension, which was in Tennessee. And I was a county extension agent, which would be comparable to the county youth coordinator here in Iowa. I was in Loudoun County, which is a small uh, county just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. And we had about 2,100 4-H members and 100 4-H clubs. And then from there, I moved to the state 4-H office in Tennessee and was the recognition and curriculum person. And then I met the love of my life and he drug me, I mean, brought me to Iowa. And I didn't have a job at the time, so I thought, well, why not just get my PhD? And so I started on a research assistantship in ag education, and uh, my research was I, I studied why people choose to major in agriculture. And I finally received that degree in 2019. But in the meantime, I just couldn't stay away from extension, so I took the job that I'm currently in. Um, with extension and outreach as an extension um, education specialist with animal science. And through that position, I do, like Maya said, I do a lot of what Maya does just with animals. And uh, then this past year, I kind of came back to that sheep that I started my life with, and I'm now teaching uh, sheep science and uh, do that uh, throughout this semester. And then I do my extension work um, in the opposite semesters. So that, uh, that was sort of my path to getting where I am. And it's been a, a fun ride, a long ride, but I feel like I have really come full circle as far as starting out with sheep. And now I'm, I'm back into sheep and really enjoying the teaching side of it. So now I get to work with college students and uh, young people in uh, 4-H and FFA and other youth organizations. I do have a farming background and uh, Linwood Farm is my family farm that I grew up with and that's the sheep farm. And then my husband and I have Peterson Farms and we have a corn and soybean uh, crop rotation up in uh, northern Iowa. One thing that I think is key to being um, to being a well-rounded person. And also it looks good on a resume. It's good to have on those college applications. It's being involved in things maybe outside of what your chosen field of study is. So for me, my big involvement is with music and being involved in my church. Those are two things I really enjoy and that give me purpose. And then as you can see, I'm involved here in Iowa and a lot of other um, ag related industries. And that has allowed me the opportunity to meet new people who are have common interests, but it's also been able to allow me to build partnerships. And um, I think that's a good way as a young person to learn about different careers and to become involved. And when we think about animal science, most people think, well, I'm going to be a veterinarian. And I get that question a lot. Oh, you have a degree in animal science. Are you a veterinarian? And I thought about it, but then I took organic chemistry and, and decided that maybe I didn't want to be a veterinarian or maybe I wasn't smart enough to be a veterinarian is probably the better word or I wouldn't study hard enough. But with a degree in animal science, there are so many opportunities um, that you can have. Uh, animal ecology is another one that allows you the opportunity to study animals. And, you know, without Maya's career choice there, we wouldn't have animals. So plants and animals are very closely related. And uh, without either one of them, you know, they, they don't thrive without each other. And so 
um, any of those fields are great things to get involved in if you really want to be involved in sustainability and feeding the country, feeding the world. Um, crops feed the world and so do animals and and they're so important to making a difference and, and keeping things going. So I think for you guys, if I could give you some advice, I would say be involved in high school, in elementary school. 4-H is one way to do that, but there's lots of other youth organizations that you can be involved in because the more involved you are, uh, the better and more well-rounded well that you are. And then for agriculture in particular, science and math classes are important. Um, we do take a lot of science classes. I think Maya would agree with that. And, uh, and math is an important part of that. So take those extra classes, be involved, uh, summer camps and summer experiences that you can do involved with agriculture or nature or science are also great things to do. And public speaking is another one of those. I was terrified to give speeches as a young person. And I'm so thankful that my parents made me do speech contests and get me involved. And so I would encourage you to take that leap of faith, especially if, if it terrifies you, which is okay to stand up in front of a group of people and speak, but to, to try it and to get out there and do that because you're gonna need that skill no matter what no matter what field you choose. And then also taking the time right now to job shadow, um, internships as well. Even, even as a young person, you can watch and, and become involved in the industry. Just go and ask a, someone that you're interested in if you can follow them around for a day or take a summer job at the vet clinic if being a veterinarian is something you wanna do. But those are some things that are so important and that really shaped my decisions, being able to intern with some of the groups that I interned with. Also showed me that some things I didn't want to do. I, I learned quickly with the Policy Analysis Center that I'm not a researcher and I don't wanna sit behind a computer and crunch data all day. Um, but I learned that, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't tried it. So those are just um, a few of my thoughts. Um, that was pretty quick, but I ha I'm happy to answer questions or I don't remember if Tiffany said we needed to wait till the end. So I will turn it back over to Tiffany then. Well, uh, Amy, while they're waiting, do you want to give them an example of the skillathon? Because that's a really good way to get some sense of your interest in animals and, and what it takes. Um, sure. So our skillathon here in Iowa, we have two, two different opportunities. One is held during the state fair. And uh, that one is species specific. So you could participate in a goat skillathon, a sheep skillathon, or a swine skillathon. And basically, you just work as a team and you do perform different tasks as it relates to that species. So you might be asked to identify feed samples and say, well, that's corn and that's oats and those are soybeans. Uh, another example is identifying cuts of meat. So that's a, a, a pork loin chop or that's a lamb rib chop or whatever it may be. And then we also do some scenarios where you have a, an animal that might be sick and you need to um, read the medication label and determine what the dosage is that you're gonna give that animal and then when you can safely um, take that animal for harvest. Then the other skillathon that we have is uh, for beef, swine, pork, and sheep all together, and goats all together. And uh, that is held this year in the fall, and you can participate on that through your as a county team. And it's similar to the other one; it's just a lot more involved, and it co covers all the species. But you rotate through stations and accomplish different tasks. Thank you. And there is a question uh, <laughs> which we get quite often, actually, and that is. People are always interested in what an average salary would be for your positions. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to go ahead and just say we do this job because we love it, <laughs> not because we get rich, but it does pay the bills. Um, and I, it varies. It, it varies a lot from university to university. Uh, the University of Tennessee is a much smaller extension organization with fewer people, but it has a higher pay salary. Here at Iowa State, we have a lot more people, um, but a little bit lower pay scale. Um, but if you went to Wisconsin, it would look different there. So extension is a little bit different than most um, other organizations. Um, 
as far as animal science goes, I can say that the starting salary for our graduates is about 45,000. And they, we have a, I think it's, we're up to a 98% placement rate within six months upon graduation. So a degree in animal science, there are tons of jobs out there and they do pay well. I mean, I would like to have made that much money when I graduated from college. Of course, that was a long time ago, but. I'll let Maya <laughs> jump in. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I do not have a super good answer for that. I think what what Amy said is a good summary. I don't have that data for oh uh, for plant sciences um, majors, but yeah, there there's going to be a wide um, variety depending a, a lot on the specific job and field. But there are a lot of jobs in agriculture, regardless of what field of study you do, and um, they're going to become more as our country grows and, and the world grows and we have to feed that population. Uh, ag careers are a big growing field, especially here in the Midwest, and definitely um, a great place to, to work and, and start your career. Um, and, and I would say that $40,000, $45,000 range is a pretty good starting. And I, you know, as, as an average, probably 50 to 60,000. Um, but there's those that make 250,000 too. So it's a big, wide open area. And you might mention, you know, we all work in the what's called the public sector. So it's, it's a government job, but your backgrounds in agronomy and in animal science really give you a basis to work either in the public or the private sector. And, and that gives you a lot of breadth and depth in those areas that you might wanna pursue. And along with that goes different um, you know, salary ranges. So you're right that I think looking at, I think I'm not sure they understood that the, if you graduate from Iowa State with a degree in agriculture, you've got a pretty good uh, uh, chance that you're gonna get a job within a few months of graduating and, and a fairly good paying job. And I think that's the thing, as you said, in the area of agriculture, it, it is a high demand field right now. Yeah, thanks Mary Sue. I think that's absolutely right. There's a lot of jobs in the private sector, in, um, in companies and also at universities and also other government positions, USDA and, um, and other um, uh, state and national government organizations also. Anybody else have a question? We have time for one more. And, and if you think of some after this, um, feel free to email me. I'm the one that sends out, this is Tiffany that sends out the other emails and we'd be happy to put you in touch um, with Amy and Maya. Mm. Um, so um, I just like starting with this picture usually because it's a friend of mine. Um, he actually passed away several years ago, but uh, great man. Um, his name was Pierce Sellers from uh, England, um, but it was an astronaut on, on one of my missions. Um, so a little background about myself, if I can click on this, all right. <clears throat> there we go. Um, so um, I actually graduated from uh, Knoxville, Iowa, uh, high school uh, here in Iowa, population about 9,000 at the time. So it's a pretty small town. Um, and, um, and then I went to Iowa State. Um, aerospace engineering was my degree. And um, during the time I was there, um, I did internships. Uh, and everybody that will listen, um, I always tell them you should definitely do an internship. Um, it will delay your graduation, but it doesn't matter because the experience you get from that um, is worth so much. Um, whether, and, and I'll go into this <clears throat> a little bit more, but um, you get so much real life experience. Um, it's a nice break from school to go do something, you know, real life. And then you're kind of refreshed and ready to come back and keep, you know, taking classes. Um, I actually alternated for multiple semesters, did multiple uh, internships. Um, there's a link down there um, and you could actually just Google, you know, NASA internships and it should take you to that intern.nasa.gov website. There's different um, types of internships, um, whether it's just for like a summer or whether it's um, automatic, you know, you're supposed to come back every other semester, things like that. Um, and, you know, what I tell the students is 
if you love it, if it's everything you've dreamed up, great. You know, now you know for sure that that's what you want. Um, and if you've had this vision of what it's like and you go there and you hate it, great. Now you know what you don't want to do, right? Don't waste your time <clears throat> doing more, inter more um, semesters going down a path that you're just in the end not going to like, right? You, you're not going to know exactly what it's like until you actually try it. Um, so again, just about any company, these were internships with NASA that I did, um, but um, many, many companies out there um, have internships. And so you should apply just whatever company you want, you know, Google them um, and then um, just uh, work on it. <clears throat> so when I first got, um, when I first graduated and got hired in, and actually multiple of my internships were actually in um, what's called the EVA group, extravehicular activities. It's the group that trains the astronauts um, how to do spacewalks. Uh, and then we work in mission control during the actual spacewalks um, to help the astronauts during all of the tasks that they perform. Um, we train them about the tools that they use, the actual tasks that they're going to perform, as well um, as the spacesuit. How does the spacesuit work? What do you do in case of emergency with the spacesuit? Um, what happens if you're trying to drive a bolt? Um, and it breaks, right? Or you can't, it's jammed or something like that, right? Any kind of failure, um, we try to prepare for that. The astronauts have so much to learn that they can't go into a lot of depth for every single thing, right? So that's why there's teams of people helping them out. And the EVA team um, was the team that I worked on for multiple missions. And so we train the astronauts, the biggest um, training or the majority of the training for the spacewalks is performed in a pool, a very large pool. It's called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. Um, so this is just kind of a side view at it. It's 200 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 40 feet deep. And then so if we go up above and look down into the water, you can see um, some of the, and I'm not sure, can you all see my cursor along here? I don't know if you can see anything I'm highlighting here. Um, so along, so these yellow cranes in the back, those, they actually lift the astronauts up and put them into the water. Um, what we're looking at is part of the truss structure of the space station. And so um, the pool, again, is 200 feet long, 100 feet wide, um, and 40 feet deep, but it's still not big enough to fit the entire space station. The entire space station fully assembled the way it is now is longer than uh, an entire football field, including the end zone. So we actually have to take the pieces apart, right? So we have some modules here, some pieces over here, and we reconfigure the space station um, in the water in order to be able to support the train that we need um, for that specific crew, all right? And so if they have a task that they need to perform, you know, over here somewhere, then we'll train them over there and then we'll maybe move them over here and do different things like that, right? So every single task that they perform, they will perform in space, they train for in the water. Um, so we get them suited up just like you do. You know, you put your pants on first on the bottom left, and then we get them into the what's called the hut, the hard upper torso, um, and then the arms, helmet, gloves, and then we dunk them into the water. And then once they're in the water, <clears throat> we actually um, do a way out, right? The, the reason we use the water is because of the buoyancy that the water provides. And so if we put foam and weights throughout different points in the spacesuit, and you can see there's weights and um, straps along their legs, and you can put and shove foam in different areas, then we can make them neutrally buoyant, right? And so they won't float up and they won't sink, and they can pretend as best we can um, that they're in zero gravity in space, right? And so then they will float around and move along the space station and be able to um, practice um, translating and moving like they would um, in real space. And so behind the, the astronauts right now, you see some divers. Um, for every astronaut, there's multiple divers there. Um, some of them are safety divers, right? So in case something happens with the spacesuit um, in the water, then the astronauts can help the astronauts, right? These aren't the same suits that are used in space. Um, the space, the ones that actually go into space have everything. It's a, it's a all-encompassing little vehicle, right? It has the oxygen, the communications, the power, the cooling systems, all of that within its own vessel. Um, these, you'll see umbilicals coming down from the surface, the white and the blue umbilicals. Those umbilicals will provide actually the power, the communications, the cooling, all of that, and the oxygen um, for 
these spaces, right? Because it actually is easier to do that. Um, behind the divers, um, then are some of the, the actual mock-ups. So the one behind them in this photo is of the space station airlock. And so the yellow lines that you see, those are handrails. And so the, those are the spots anywhere along the entire space station that the astronauts can grab onto. And while it's called a spacewalk, they don't use their feet that much, right? They move around using their hands, um, what's called hand over hand, right? You grab one handle and you grab the next one, then you move over and you keep sliding along. So this is uh, another training event, and this was actually for the Hubble Space Telescope. So I was the EVA lead, the spacewalking lead, for the last Hubble Space Telescope serving, servicing mission. Um, I also worked um, on missions for the Assembly of the International Space Station um, and, and other spacewalks as well. And so inside of here, you would see that this is representative of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, there are doors down here inside there are some scientific instruments that take that light from the stars, right? And then um, eventually send it down to the ground so they, um, the astronomy um, community can get all the information they want. So we had to open up these doors and then fix some of the instruments inside. And so you see a robotic arm that would have been used um, inside of the space shuttle payload bay. Um, and then one astronaut inside and one outside that would be handing them tools and, and helping out. Um, so as part of um, the preparations for missions, um, what we did was we would train the astronauts um, on the ground and then right before launch, we would actually go out to the space shuttle um, before it launched and made sure that everything was as we had trained, right? It's kind of a final review, um, uh, a pre-final test, I guess, because the final test is really when they were in space. Um, and so we would um, go out to the launch pad. This would have been about two or three days before launch. You can see the big orange external tank, the two white solid rocket boosters. And then this part back here, in the next picture, we'll zoom in. This is actually the belly, the shuttle tiles that you would see underneath of the space shuttle. So we would walk around here, go inside the space shuttle and talk to the astronauts about the final, final training. Um, so I worked in the EVA group for many years and then I was selected as a manager of that group. Uh, and then I applied and, and uh, was selected as a flight director. Um, and so I talk about, again, having to take exams because, um, you know, after you graduate, a lot of times, you know, students feel like, okay, I'm done with tests, I'm done with exams, but that's just, you know, not the case. It's basically, um, you're just having to learn something new. And so in this case, after being a flight director, I had to learn all about the entire space station um, as when I was in the EVA group, it was specific to the spacesuits and those things. When I was selected as a flight director, it was the entire space station, right? So the flight director is actually the person that's in charge of mission control. Um, and if you have heard of Gene Krantz in this right-hand picture, that's the gentleman that's sitting down. Gene Krantz was the third flight director ever in the history of NASA. I was several years later, um, but I was uh, number 82. Um, so we talk about engineers being problem solvers, right? A lot of times, and so um, specifically, you know, it just depends on your area. And so I was aerospace engineering and working at NASA, um, you know, all types of engineers that solve all different problems. So for me, you know, part of it was how do we assemble this International Space Station? And so the International Space Station is truly international. It has um, elements from the Japanese um, Space Agency, the Russian Space Agency, Europeans, Canadians, US, you know, all across the world. And many of those parts never were checked to see if they would fit together before they got into space, right? So you want to make sure that you have done your homework and, and of course, designed it and built it correctly. And so um, in the front screen is the FGB, um, the first module that was launched by the Russians in November of 98. And then in the forefront is then the first module, just a a few weeks later, the U.S. launched its first element um, from the shuttle. It took uh, three different spacewalks to put it together. And then eventually after the shuttle left, um, those are the first two elements, um, the Russian one on the left and then the U.S. element on the right um, that began uh, the assembly of the International Space Station, right? And just like Legos, um, it takes a little piece, you know, one piece at a time. The difference was nobody gave us the instructions um, and luckily we didn't have extra pieces also. 
Um, but um, we had to write all the procedures, right? And so in the bottom part of the picture, you'll see it's just one page out of millions of pages of procedures that we had to write to do the entire assembly of the space system. Um, so a couple of things, I'm trying to keep it short. So I grew up in Knoxville, um, Knoxville, Iowa. I ended up at NASA, right? I always wanted to work at NASA um, all through high school. Everybody knew it. Um, I had a graduating class of 102. Um, everybody in my class knew that, that I wanted to work at NASA. Um, I was not only able to achieve that, but um, I was selected as a flight director. Um, again, there are still less than 100 flight directors ever in the history of NASA since its conception in 1958. Um, and so there are actually less flight directors ever in the history of NASA than there have been astronauts. Um, so that's that's pretty incredible um, goal that I was able to, to accomplish for myself. And, and so really, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you want to do, um, you really um, should just go for it, right? You should just try it. Um, Peggy Whitson, a friend of mine um, from uh, Mount Air, Iowa, um, you know, <laughs> even smaller than Knoxville, and, um, and she was you know, selected as an astronaut. So um, challenge yourself to achieve whatever you want. Um, the very last thing, um, you know, Nike's um, slogan, um, I, maybe about four years ago, um, when I moved back to Iowa, um, I was having lunch with, um, with this um, young engineer that was working for a different company. Um, and he was very excited to be talking to me because, you know, we started talking and he said, I always wanted to be working for NASA. And my first thought is, well, then why aren't you? You know, I'm, I'm not a genius. I worked hard. Um, and I got good grades because I worked hard. Um, I'm sure that he was equally qualified and able to work for NASA. Um, so again, if it's something you want to do, um, you should try it, right? Make them tell you no. Um, and if they tell you no, then try again. And if they tell you no, then try again, right? Many astronauts have applied 10 or more times um, before they were selected. I, I'm not sure I know of any astronaut that was selected on their first try. Um, and so again, try and try and, and just challenge yourself to, to doing it. Um, and that's all I have. Awesome, very inspirational message. Thank you very much. Um, and, and again, I, I learned a lot too. I hope you all did. You have time um, for a few questions? Um, I do, yep. Okay, great. So go ahead and either you can unmute to ask your questions or feel free to um, add it in the in the chat. Um, I, I have one that I'll kick it off with though is in, in high school, since you said you were really, um, one always wanted to be in NASA, what were some either classes or activities that you did that maybe kind of helped, you know, helped with that? Sure. Um, I mean, in high school, I took all the math and science that I could. Um, one of these back in my day, you know, type of statements, but, um, you know, we didn't really have um, the AP classes. I mean, that was just be becoming a thing. Um, but again, all the, the highest math that I could take, um, all the science, you know, I even took biology classes. I, I knew that I, um, you know, that's not what I wanted to do, but I knew that um, getting more experience with science and just, um, you know, trying to think through and solving problems and riddles and stuff like that, um, that's the type of brain, you know, that, that I had and, and that's what I enjoyed. And, and then, you know, I knew that I wanted engineering, um, both actually my my parents knew that pretty early on too. Um, both of my grandfathers um, were engineers and they could just tell that I had that gene too. Um, and then I, you know, was fascinated with, um, with planes and space. And so, you know, that's why I knew I wanted aerospace. Great, thank you. Um, we have next question is what's your favorite planet? My favorite planet, oh man. <clears throat> um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that I have one. Um, you, you know, it, it's a little sad to me that Pluto was demoted. <laughs> so that's, that's one of my favorites. Um, I love the rings um, on Saturn. Um, I really love the blue color of, of Neptune. Um, I love that, you know, Mars is, is close and, and we want to, you know, target going there. Um, so those are probably, you know, my favorites, obviously, of course, Earth, because we live here as well. Great, thanks. And have you, have there, have, 
Uh, maybe have there ever been any um, International Space Station pieces that didn't fit? And if so, what happened to them? Um, you know, not, not of the big pieces, like the big modules. Um, there have been like smaller boxes, like we changed something out. Um, I mean, there are, I mean, it's kind of like your house. Um, you know, there are batteries. Um, I mean, there are solar panels also on the space station, but there are, you know, boxes that are basically, you know, circuit breakers and things like that. Um, and so if, you know, you, you blow a fuse, it's not as simple as just changing out a fuse. You have to change out this entire box, um, you know, and we've had issues um, removing it or putting it back in. Um, a lot of times it's because um, either the bolt is jammed or the, um, <clears throat> there's kind of usually guide rails, you know, so you have this box and there's guide rails that help slide it in to make sure that everything lines up right. Um, something might be, you know, off-centered or something like that. You know how even, I mean, just in any box, you're trying to pull something down and if you don't pull it straight, then it kind of jiggles and jams. And so there's a lot of things like, you know, little things like that that have happened. Um, not a lot of big items uh, apart from things just sticking and you either had to pull harder or, um, I mean, we've had to, you know, break a bolt or something like that as well. And But there's usually... Um, you know, three or four bolts. And so now it's like, okay, well, we're just going to use two bolts instead of three and, and they would still work. Awesome. Um, and I'm asking Natalie to see if she can clarify. I'm not sure what she meant by what do you like about it, whether your, your position about NASA or about your planets. <laughs> so um, Natalie, do you, is there, you, you're welcome to unmute and let us know so we know that we're answering your question correctly. Yeah, we'll see if she responds in that. But currently, um, can you share just a little bit about what you do at Iowa State right now? Sure. Yeah, no, I completely skipped that, didn't I? Um, yeah, so I um, right now teach um, the Aerospace Engineering uh, Senior Design course. Um, and so there are two of us. Um, the other faculty member teaches the aeronautical focus, so airplanes, um, drones, things like that, um, that everything within the atmosphere. Um, because of my NASA background, then I teach the um, space-related designs. And so both of us go through the design process, right? We each give you a um, kind of a problem, right? And we say that, hey, each of you, we, we put you all in teams. Um, and then we say, hey, here's the problem, you know, and I would say NASA is looking for a design for something to be able to solve this problem. And I need a, maybe a drone that can fly around, you know, the outside of the International Space Station, and do some observations and gather information and stuff like that. It needs to fit through the airlock. It needs to be smaller than this and not be as massive as that. Um, and so, and then that's kind of the, the whole first semester. It's a two semester course. And then in the second semester, um, you actually build something. And so just like I talked about the, the big pool um, that NASA has um, in Howe Hall, there's actually a pool in the basement. Um, it's only 20 feet um, in diameter and 20 feet deep um, instead of, you know, uh, 200 by 100. But, uh, but it, the reason we use the pool is the same thing, right, the buoyancy. And so we have um, little air thrusters, basically, that we mount to their devices, and then they try to fly them around and, and do various things. Great. Thank you for sharing. And Natalie, um, she said, what do you like about the planet? So some of you mentioned some of the rings, but if there were others that you had mentioned. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, again, Mars, um, just being so close, you know, it's, it's some place that's reachable. It's a place that, um, you know, we have the potential opportunity to, to really live and to expand into Mars. Um, you know, um, Jupiter and Saturn, you know, those planets are, are gas giants. We, we would be crushed, um, you know, if we tried anything there. Um, but, um, you know, again, Neptune, just that beautiful blue color. Um, and again, I think I just feel sorry for Pluto. So that's why I like Pluto. Yeah. Thank you. And did you go to space? Iris asked. Um, I did not. I wanted to, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, again, I, I got to be a flight director, which really, um, is, um, is there are less flight directors than astronauts have been. Um, we did, though, as part of the training um, for, um, for the, the spacewalking group, 
we do actually get to get in the suit and in the space suit um, various times and get to, um, to move around underwater, just like we've trained the astronauts. Um, there's also this airplane called the, called the Vomit Comet or the Zero G plane. Um, and you kind of float inside for about 20 seconds or so at a time and you do various parabolas. Um, and, uh, and we got to fly in that to do some experiments and do some, some other training and things like that as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, Wyatt has a question, if you were to like, um, start to drift off into space, would you be able to change your trajectory by doing anything? Sure, um, actually uh, the, the astronauts wear these jet packs um, and they're called SAFER, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. So the, the jet packs are only there in case they float away from the space station, for example. Now there's, um, that would be most to have at least one hand on the space station. Um, when they get to a location and they're gonna do work, they actually have these hooks that they kind of attach themselves, kind of like um, the, the pole climbers, right? They hook themselves on. Um, and so if they let go and that hook came off, they also have um, what's called a safety tether line. And so kind of like rock climbers, right? We have um, a hook at one end um, and then the other hook is attached to them. And then there's a long cable that's really strong. Um, and so even if they fell off, um, they'd be able to pull themselves in by this cable. So if all those things went wrong, then they could actually use their jetpack and fly themselves back. Wow, how fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we got one more question. Time for one more question. Um, anybody? Um, and if you think of others, again, for any of our speakers tonight, um, after the fact, feel free to email me and we'll make sure that we get those questions um, answered. Um, but if not, we want to thank you, Tomas, for being here today. That, um, I, I really appreciate that. And I hope everybody else kind of took away some um, really neat things. And especially at the end, that no matter who you are or where you came from or your background, that you can really achieve that, that, that highest goal that you have. So that's really cool. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. For more information on Polk County 4-H programming, connect with us by email at polk4h at iastate.edu or by phone at 515-957-5760.